Hello and welcome to a digital lecture for Calculus 2 at Sully Community College. In this video we're going to go through the last section of chapter 11, which is the 11.10 Taylor and McLaurin series. Alright guys, so this is where I say the, the last difficulty peak of the class comes in. Um, I, I've usually said that chapter 11 is one of the difficulty peaks and this is going to be the last part of that. Moving into chapter 12, I really doubt that you're going to have any troubles with those. I, I never really have students that have too much trouble with that chapter. Very few, but nowhere near as many issues as the, pre as the previous ones. Um, this is going to be one of the heftiest sections, so you, you're really going to need to get this one down and, and try a lot with this in practice. Um, it's not going to be the easiest, and it, 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 they tend to take a little bit of time, but they do involve just a lot of derivatives um, and, and a lot of uh, evaluation of what those derivatives are. So I think after seeing a few of them, it'll start to click after a while, even though it will seem a little bit obtuse as for, at first because you are just going to be taking a lot of uh, successive derivatives. Okay. Um, so diving into this, we're thinking again about what power series are. So we have this general function for power series, which we should be familiar with. And we've also been taking derivatives. We did those a couple times with natural log of 1 plus x and also tan inverse of x. However, what we're also going to do is consider what happens when you take the general form of a power series and take the derivative. That's what we have shown here. If you take the general form of a power series, expand it out, and then you take the derivative of that, what's going to happen is the constant's going to go away, and then each of these x plus minus a terms is going to decrease in their exponent value by 1. So x minus a will, will decrease by 1 to go to 0, and that 1 will come down in front. So you get 1 uh, times c1. Likewise, this 1 with the constant of the second constant, or x sub 2, that 2 will come out front and then multiply by x minus a to the 1 power. And that will happen to each term. If you do that again, the, se the second derivative will take away that constant again. And now you have all the other terms going to be multiplied by the new exponents. So you get 1 times 2 from here. Then you get 2 times 3 from here. And you get 3 times 4 from here. So all those are going to be decreasing. And that pattern will continue over and over and over again because you're taking a polynomial. What's going to necessarily happen is that you're just going to keep multiplying by that, uh, that exponent. Um, and that exponent will be decreasing by 1 every time. So what we really focus on is the pattern of what we start to see here from the coefficients. Notice this right here. Start with the coefficient of 0, then 1, 1 times 2, 1 times 2 times 3, 1 times 2 times 3 times 4. This should look very familiar. This itself is a factorial, specifically a factorial of, in this, the bottom case here, that's 4 factorial. And we see that pattern throughout. 1 times 2 times 3, that's 3 factorial. 1 times 2, that's 2 factorial. 1 is 1 factorial, and technically this also has a 1, which is also 0 factorial. So we see all these factorials. And for successive terms, we see the permutations of those because they're truncated a bit. Say 3 times 4 times 5, that's technically the permutation of 5, which is not including 1 times 2. Now, if we then take those derivatives that we found and we set x equal to a, what then happens is that everything that involves an x minus a term is going to cancel out. So, say if I take a thicker marker here, this x minus a term on the, in the original function, gone. x minus a, gone, gone, gone. All these with x minus a are going to be eliminated from the functions that we've made and the derivatives. And therefore, what we have left then is evaluations of how to find each of those constants f of a equals that first constant. The derivative of f uh, taken at a is also constant 1. Then the second derivative at a is the constant 2 multiplied by 2 factorial. And therefore, if we simply evaluate and get the constants by themselves, we get this overall pattern show up. First constant is the, first, uh, is the function at a, the 
c sub 1 is the first derivative at a, c sub 2 is the second derivative of a divided by 2 factorial, third derivative at a divided by 3 factorial, fourth derivative of a divided by 4 factorial, etc., etc. And overall, a general pattern that the constant values can be found by taking the nth derivative at a and then dividing by n factorial. Again, this being true specifically for the geometric series, power series that we've been talking about. Now I talk about some other things here, talking about how specifically that uh, this means that the constants are each based on that specific function itself and not some other function. Therefore, the power series representation that uses these constants is going to be unique. Also, I'm just noticing that there's an extra equation sign here, not necessary. Um, and that uniqueness uh, thing is very nice because that means that the power series that we create is only going to be true for that one function and every function has its own power series as long as it does have one. Uh, but this evaluation of a constant will let us actually calculate what the constant is based on the derivative of those functions with also n factorial which is just a numeric. And that will come up to what we call the Taylor series about that value a. The Taylor series will be represented as such. If a function has a power series expansion, we can write it like this. We can write the power series, we can take the constant c sub n and replace it with what we just found, the nth derivative at a over n factorial. Now a couple other notes, the series will have a radius of convergence r and an interval of convergence of x minus a less than r. This should be familiar to us. Furthermore, if you consider the partial sum of this series, you get the partial sum up to the nth term, and then you're gonna have a remainder after that. The reason I point this out is because of that first clause for the Taylor series. That first clause is very important. In fact, this says if a function has a power series expansion. That, that means that not all functions will have a power series expansion. It depends. And what that depends on is that, re that uh, remainder here. If that remainder goes to zero, then that means that uh, the nth, the nth uh, partial sum is a good enough representation up to some specific point. But if that remainder isn't going to zero, then that means that um, this summation is going to also infinitely expand, which means it's not going to be true for some radius of convergence. Therefore, it essentially doesn't converge overall. So that means that we need to look at that remainder term, and we need to consider what happens with that remainder term as n goes to infinity. If that remainder term goes to zero, then we're good. And that means we can use the nth partial sum and it converges. In order to do that, well, with the Taylor series, we also have Taylor's inequality. With Taylor's inequality, what we're gonna do is take the n plus one derivative, which would be in the remainder term, because the remainder term would be the term following the uh, last term in the nth sum, in the nth partial sum and we want to bound that by some value m we want to do that because it's easier to do that than to explicitly find what n plus the nth derivative is or n plus one derivative is at some specific value we want to bound that derivative which tends to be easier for some x minus a within some uh within some ra uh, radius basically, or within some distance. If we could do that, then the remainder satisfies that the absolute value of the remainder is less than or equal to m over n plus one factorial times x minus a to the n plus one. This should look like the nth term is that it, essentially. The only difference being that you have m on top instead of the nth derivative or the n plus one derivative. Now, the true goal of this, because that looks a little bit obtuse, the true goal of this is to show that this second part is going to be less than or equal to zero. If, or really equal to zero, really. Specifically, that is going to zero. If we could do that, then by the squeeze theorem, we could take that the limit of the uh, remainder is going to be less than or equal to the limit of that stuff, which is going to zero itself. Therefore, the limit is going to zero too. So that's what we're really going to do, is we're going to take the limits of this second piece and show that it goes to zero. 
If we could do that, then we're good. We're solid. A common trick, essentially, with these, this is kind of like an Epsilon Delta proof. Um, the common tr trick in these is to choose a value for D. So come up with some value for D. Uh, maybe it's an explicit number. Maybe we just use D itself. Um, just the letter D. And then we can use that to establish what we can bound the function by based on what the derivative looks like. Or the n plus one derivative. Usually that's how we'll do it. Sometimes the n plus one derivative is very easy to handle and therefore we don't really need to bound it by anything complicated. But overall, this is what we're going to do. And if we could do that, this can be very nice because m is just a constant and this is x to the n plus one power over n plus one factorial. And as we talked about, n factorial is stronger than x to the n power. We had that back when we were talking about the ratio test. So therefore, this limit is going to go to zero. Essentially, if we can get a constant value for m, we're done because that limit will always go to zero. Okay. Now, we'll have a couple examples of that because again, that uh, it looks complicated and it's not the easiest thing to do, but we'll see some examples of that. But before we do, one last note is that if you have a equal to zero, that's a special case of something called a Maclaurin series. Essentially, we're going to be centering the, ra uh, the radius of convergence at the origin and saying that the series is going to be convergent for a, a, ratio, a radius around that origin point, so around those specific values. That will differ sometimes. Maybe you want the series that you make to be accurate closer to some other specific value down the line. But a lot of the times we're going to do a equals zero. And that has a special name. That is going to be called a Maclaurin series. Maclaurin series is simply a Taylor series at a equals zero, which means that you're doing the nth derivative at zero, and you have x minus a, where, x, where a is zero, so you just x. These are so much more simple to deal with, and a majority of the questions you have will be specifically Maclaurin series. Now, it's a lot of explanation, but let's see a couple examples of these so you can see really how we're going to approach this. The easiest one, I think, is this first example, is the function of e to the x power. Now, I may have already talked about this one in class, but we're going to be able to evaluate this explicitly mathematically with the Taylor series and Maclaurin series in mind. All right, the first thing we're going to want to do is find the derivative of each of these. Maybe the first few so we can start to see a pattern. So the function is e to the x. Let's find the first couple of derivatives. This is typically how we're going to approach most of these problems. The reason why this one is easy is because the first derivative is e to the x, the second derivative is e to the x, third derivative is e to the x. And we should, at that point, we should start to see a pattern, whether this is going to be the same derivative every time, in this case it is, or if we see some other thing happening with them. Then what we want to do, because we're finding Maclaurin series, that means that a equals zero, and we want to find what happens for each of these functions at zero. So the first derivative at zero, the second derivative at zero, third derivative at zero, And again, in this case, because all the functions are just e to the x, we know that e to the 0 is 1, and therefore all of these are going to be 1. So then we have that by the Maclaurin series expansion, I can even scroll up so you can see it. We have that the nth derivative at 0 is always 1 for all of them. So then we can say that our function e to the x can be represented by this summation from n equals 0 to infinity of the nth derivative at 0 is always 1 so we'll just say 1 on top over n factorial times x to the n which I'll just put here that is the Maclaurin series expansion for e to the x now the next question is okay well where does it converge? What is the radius of convergence? 
Now, in this case, um, the radius of convergence isn't going to necessarily be less than one. We can easily find the, ratio, the radius of convergence by doing the ratio test. The ratio test for this is gonna be relatively simple. We want the limits of a sub n plus one over a sub n, remember. So that means we want the limits of the original taken to the n plus one power. So x to the n plus one over n plus one factorial times the uh, reciprocal of this. Did enough of these probably. Each of these as n goes to infinity. And we know that x to the n plus one over x to the n is just going to leave you with a value of x on top. And on the bottom, n factorial over n plus one factorial will leave n plus one on the bottom. Since this is the limit as n approaches infinity and only the bottom is dependent on n, we have x over infinity, which doesn't really matter what x is, this is going to go to zero. And that's going to go to zero for all values of x. So no matter what x is, this is going to be convergent. It's always going to be less than zero because by the ratio test, This is convergent, and it will always be convergent because no matter what x is, that limit will always go to zero. So the radius of convergence is infinity, and the interval, or the, yeah, the interval is all real numbers. Now, that's, that's, that's good and all that we have now this and we have the radius of convergence. However, what we kind of skipped was the primary clause of the Taylor series. If I scroll up, remember that the, primary, uh, the first clause of the Taylor series is if the function has a power series expansion. We need to validate that it does have a power series expansion. So therefore, we're going to need to apply Taylor's inequality. Remember that Taylor's inequality right here is that we're trying to show that for the nth derivative being bounded by some value for x minus a less than d, which in this case is x less than d, then the remainder is going to satisfy this. And if we could show that this limit goes to zero, then we're solid. Now, again, I said the trick was to choose a value for d or to keep or to use that and then find what m should be, which is just going to be some constant number. So let's see how we would do that here. And we don't need too much space because again, it looks more complicated than it actually is. Now we have, again, I'll maybe do that right here. We have again that the function of x is e to the x, right? And that also means that the nth derivative of x is equal to e to the x. We know that. So, if we have that x minus a, which in this case a is zero because it's Maclaurin, so x is less than or equal to d. So again, start with this and then try to validate what the nth derivative should be. Well, if x is less than some number for d, then that means that e to the x compared to e to the d, e to the x is gonna be less than e to the d because x is less than d. This is what I mean by using this clause to come up with a value to bound your nth derivative. The nth derivative here is e to the x. So we now have what we can bound e, uh, that by because e to the d is just, that, that's just a constant. e to some constant value d is just some constant itself. And so if we consider the limits, we have the limits 
of the remainder of the nth uh, term is going to be less than or equal to the remainder or the limits as n approaches infinity of, in this case, m is e to the d. It's just some constant over n plus 1 factorial times x to the n plus 1. And in this case, this is the exact same thing as the limit we just did up here, really. Um, it's going to evaluate to be the exact same thing. The only, again, the only difference is that we were multiplying by a constant. But if this limit is going to go to zero, then multiplying by a constant isn't going to change that. Zero times a constant is still zero. So therefore, if you do this limit as x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 factorial, n plus 1 factorial will always win. And you'll have that this limit goes to zero. So the limit as n approaches infinity of the remainder term is also zero, which is all we need. That's saying that if I were to take the nth term or the nth sum, then the uh, t terms left, left over are going to be progressively decreasing, that there's going to be less and less left over overall. That's all we need. So that's how you would use Taylor's inequality. Again, the best part about this is that you actually don't even need to evaluate the limit. The limit as of a constant times x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 factorial will always go to 0. We've shown that before. We've done a couple examples of that. You can do it yourself if you so please. Okay, so that would be finding the McLaurin series for e to the x. Now we're going to do a similar process for most of these. So I know it's long, it takes a little while. That's why I said that this is uh, something you're going to need to really uh, buckle down and focus on. But let's do another one. Let's do the McLaurin series for the function sine of x. Again, what we want to find are the derivatives. We want to see what's happening with this function. So the function itself is sine. And we want to find maybe first few derivatives. Maybe up to the fourth one. OK, well, the derivative of sine is cosine of x. Note that this is already different than the previous one because now the derivatives are changing. Derivative of cosine is negative sine x. Derivative of negative sine is negative cosine x. And then when I take the derivative of negative cosine, I get back to positive sine x. So I get a recursive nature here. Uh, this, this should kind of actually make you think of uh, i, really. So like something like i and then i squared and i to the third and i to the fourth. And then you start seeing that recursive nature at that point. It should be kind of similar to that. Now, because we see that recursive nature, we know what happens overall moving forward. Uh, for anything, if it's divisible by 4, we know it's sine, and then we should be able to tell by the remainder of whatever derivative I'm working with what, fu what function I have. Yet again, though, we're working with the McLaurin series, so that means that a is equal to 0. So we want to find f of 0, f prime of 0, f double prime of 0, all these derivatives at 0. And this is going to be where it's, this one's kind of neat. Sine of 0 is 0, and that's going to be true for all the ones where sine is 0. Cosine of 0, however, is 1. And negative cosine of, of 0 is negative 1. What that means is that all of the, in this case, even derivatives, the second derivative, the fourth derivative, the sixth derivative, the zeroth derivative, are all 0. They all nullify. The only ones remaining are the odd derivatives. And we start to see 1, negative 1. We'd expect the next one to be a positive 1. And that would be true because it would be cosine, then negative cosine, then cosine, then negative cosine. We'd have a recursive nature as we already, did, as we already showed. So then we should be able to talk about what the function looks like as a summation. All right, using the standard formula, 
n equals zero of the nth derivative at zero over n factorial x to the n for a Maclaurin series. We have zero for the first derivative or the original function, so we're gonna nullify that first term. If n is equal to one, the first derivative is a positive one times x to the one over one factorial gives you one. And then at three, we get negative, so we get minus x to the three over three factorial. If we have at the fifth derivative, we're gonna have a positive again. And then we have x to the fifth over five factorial, looking at these last two pieces here. Then minus x to the seventh over seven factorial plus x to the ninth over nine factorial minus et cetera, et cetera. We see a pattern here. This kind of looks like how we derived tan inverse in the previous section. And we have now that this function can be represented as a summation. Noticing just that we have the odd terms. So we can say that we have x to the 2n plus 1, if we start at 0, over, in this case, 2n plus 1 factorial. That's how we can represent all the odd terms. But we also see the alternating nature, so we'd need to include that. Negative 1, and if we take that to the n power, let's check, n, to the, n being 0, that's negative 1 to the 0 is positive 1. And we do start off with a positive, so that's okay. If we start off with a negative, we'd have n minus one or n plus one, whichever one you'd like. But that's the power series expansion for sine. Okay. Now this one, just like e to the x, if you do the limit of this via the ratio test, you should find that um, the factorial is going to win it takes a little bit more work, um, but I'll just say by the same or similar evaluation as e to the x, this function has a radius of convergence of infinity and an interval of all real numbers. I'll leave that to you if you so please. Just takes a little bit more work. You have a couple extra terms show up in the factorial than before, but that's about it. Evaluates the same way. However, what about verifying whether this power series is legit or not, if we were even allowed to do this? Well, that's actually a lot easier than the previous one. Note the previous one we started off considering what the derivatives look like. In this one, the derivatives aren't the same. They're, they're sine and cosine. However, all we need to do is bound that derivative. And bounding this derivative is very easy. Whatever the derivative is, n plus one x power, whether this ends up being a sine or a cosine, sine and cosine are bounded by one. And we can use that as our value for m. That's true for any value of d. For x being less than d. Meaning, it doesn't matter what value of d we choose um, to, to restrict x by. The, the, the nth derivative of anything here for sine and cosine is just going to be less than 1. At least when we take the absolute value. Even if we don't. Therefore, what we have then is the limits of r sub n of x is less than or equal to the limits of n approaches infinity of, in this case, m is just 1. So we'll say x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 factorial. Again, factorial will beat this. This equals 0. So the limits of the nth term is going to go to zero. Done. Far easier to do for sine and cosine because we already know that sine and cosine are bounded. So that's all we need to do to prove that we're allowed to even make this 
series. All right, so we, those are all our pieces there. We have the series, we have the proof, we have the radius, and we have the interval. It's everything. Again, let's do some more. Example three for cosine is probably gonna be pretty easy because we basically just did this, but the series is gonna look a little bit different. All right. Now, last time we went to the fourth derivative to see recursive, so let's do that again here. It'll probably be true as well. For cosine, you start off with cosine of x, derivative of that is negative sine. Then you get negative cosine x, then you get sine x from that, and then you return back to cosine. Yet again, since we're dealing with the Maclaurin series, we have a is zero, so we're going to plug in zero into all of these derivatives and see what we get. Cosine of zero is one, sine of zero is zero, cos Cosine of zero times negative one is negative one. Sine of zero is zero. Cosine of zero is one. In this case, the terms that are going to go away are the odd numbered terms. Last time, the even numbered terms went away. So, when we take the function of x equal to just the original definition for Maclaurin series, the nth derivative of x over n factorial x to the n, Oh, not x of 0. We see that we keep the first term, so 1 when x is when n is 0, so n x to the 0 is 1, 0 factorial is 1, so we just start off with 1. We skip x to the 1 power and we go to x to the 2nd power. At x to the 2nd power, we have a minus x to the 2nd over 2 factorial. We skip x to the 3rd power and go to x to the 4th power, which is going to be a positive. Then we skip x to the fifth power and go to x to the sixth power, which is going to be a minus. We see a series that looks kind of like the one from the sign. However, in this case, all the even powers are sticking around. So we're going to have, in this case, x to the 2n. Over on the bottom, we can just say 2n factorial. Lastly, we again also see the alternating nature of this. So we have negative 1 to the n power. A series that looks a little bit like, co uh, like sine. Okay. Now, for the exact same reasons, if you were to take the limit of that by the ratio test, the factorial will leave a factorial term on the bottom, will leave a term of n on the bottom, and x to the 2n will eliminate all powers of n on the top. So you're going to be left with a limit that goes to zero no matter what x is. So just like e to the x, just like sine, it'll be the same way. So you will also find that the radius of convergence is infinity, and you have the interval is all real numbers. If you also wanted to say all real numbers as negative infinity to positive infinity, that's also fine. And lastly, the proof works just like the last one. The nth derivative, or the n plus 1th derivative, is either going to be sine or cosine. Regardless, it's going to be bounded by 1. So you have the limit of the remainder term is less than or equal to the limit of x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 factorial, which goes to 0. So the limit of the remainder term is 0, and you're done. So basically, the exact same evaluation as sine. Now, looking at these series, again, they look very similar between sine and cosine. I recommend the best way to think about this is remember from trig that sine is considered an odd function. Uh, odd function when comparing the graph of it and trying to reflect it across the y-axis or around the origin. Since you can uh, rotate it around the origin, it is considered an odd function. Likewise, all the terms we had for sine are odd values. So 2n plus 1 and 2n plus 1. 
cosine is considered an even function. So this is odd. Whereas cosine is considered an even function. Likewise, cosine has 2n and 2n, which are how you represent even numbers. So if you're trying to remember sine and cosine, that's probably the easiest way to do it. Okay. Let's do another. I have plenty of these planned. But the more you see them, the better. This one, we're going to find the Taylor series of the function f of x equals cosine x at c equals 2 pi over 3. So this is going to be the first time we're doing a Taylor series instead of a Maclaurin. Okay, well, we already know what the derivatives of these look like. Again, we're going to do up to the fourth power because we know at that point it starts to become recursive. We did that with Maclaurin. It'll also be true for Taylor. So cosine x minus sine x minus cosine x sine x and back to cosine but now in this case we're going to be plugging in a or c rather where I should actually say a yeah um, in this case we're centered at that point so we're going to say each of those derivatives at a It's not going to be as easy as before because these aren't all going to cancel out. In fact, when you plug in 2 pi thirds into cosine, 2 pi thirds is in quadrant 2. It's close to the y-axis. That will give you negative 1 half. And then when you have sine at uh, 2 pi thirds, you get uh, root 3 over 2, which is in uh, quadrant 1 or quadrant 2 where sine is positive, so that's going to give you root 3 over 2 times a negative out front, so negative root 3 over 2. And then we already know cosine gives you negative 1 half, so that will give you a positive 1 half. This will give you a positive root 3 over 2. And we're back to negative 1 half again. Definitely not as nice as the last one. However, we can still try to evaluate this. It'll probably take a little bit more time. Again, I'm going to start off with the base form of it, so the sum of the nth derivative. In this case, we're taking at 2 pi thirds, which is what we did, over n factorial. In this case, we're also going to have x minus a, which is 2 pi thirds, to the n power. So let's see what this looks like. Uh, I don't know if I'll, I don't think I'll have enough room there. I want enough room to put this around, so we'll put it down here. Um, okay, so equals. I'm going to put uh, all the terms we see here. So first, uh, if n is equal to 0, those terms to the n power and n factorial go away. But the nth term at 0 is negative 1 half. Plus, the, nth, the first derivative at 2 pi thirds is negative 3 halves. So negative root 3 or negative root 3 over 2. And then we have all this. So we have x minus 2 pi over 3 to the n power over 1 factorial. And then we have 1 half times that same stuff, but with 2 instead of 1. So second power and 2 factorial. And then we have root 3 over 2, positive, times x minus 2 pi over 3 to the third power over 3 factorial. And then we have back to negative 1 half times x minus 2 pi over 3 to the fourth power over 4 factorial. So the first four terms would look like. Note that all these values I found above, I'm going to multiply each of my terms by. And then after that, all I'm doing is just increasing the exponents and the factorial on the denominator. Now, writing this as one summation isn't, isn't exactly easy, and we don't want to keep it as this. Um, we may be able to split this up into two, though, particularly because of the leading coefficients. All right, so I'm going to, let's see. All right, so I'm going to say the ones that I underline in green, I'm going to keep 
together. So the negative one half, the positive one half, the negative one half. So those are the even terms together. And the negative terms are going to keep together as well, or the odd terms are going to keep together. And let's see if we can write something for this. Okay, for the, uh, let's do the green terms first. So we start with negative one half, and we're taking that to some power, and that's going to be changing alternately. So we'll say negative one half taken to a power. If we say n, that's not gonna be true because that would go to zero. But if we say something like n minus one, or n plus one rather, that would bring this to one power, one power, and we don't want that to the one power. The only thing that's alternating is the negative one actually. So we're gonna say, negative one to, in this case, the n plus one power, and then we have that one half that's multiplying everything. And then for everything else, we have x minus two pi over three over, in this case, we have the even terms. So we're gonna say on the bottom, two n factorial, an exponent of two n, just like we did for cosine. That looks pretty good. Now you could do some more manipulation to make it look a little bit prettier, at least in terms of how we wrote that, but that should be fine. Plus the summation for the red terms. The red terms, again, are alternating and they start off negative, so we're gonna have another negative one to the n plus one. But in this case, they're multiplying by root three over two. And then we have x minus two pi over three. And these are all the odd terms. So we're going to have two n plus one factorial and two n plus one as an exponent there. Yeah, that seems good. Just like the sine terms or just like sine looked like earlier. All right. And that should be good for the Taylor series. Now we don't really need to address the other things. You can write it down. Um, but we, but since we're using cosine, we already know cosine has an interval of, um, of all real numbers, has a, a radi radius of infinity. And we know that it is valid to make a series for this because we showed that for the Maclaurin series. So it would also be true for any other point. So because of example three, we know this is valid and what the radius and interval of convergence are. Because we already did that, it's for cosine, doesn't really matter what else changes there. We are just finding if you're allowed to make a series for that function. Centered doesn't really matter. All right, but that would be making a Taylor series there. Taylor series aren't necessarily the prettiest and sometimes you need to split up into two summations because you can't necessarily uh, make this too nice. I'm trying to think of any other way of doing it, maybe trying to manipulate that root three to multiply by something so it either becomes one or root three. A little bit harder to do though. Okay, now I have a couple more examples here. This one, example five, is I think one of the most important things to get down personally. Um, the function e to the ix. Now, why I think this is important. Function e to the ix. Well, we already know what e to the, e to the x is. We know the function of e to the x is defined by this Maclaurin series. n equals zero to infinity of x to the n over n factorial. Now if this is ix, this is just gonna to change to 
ix to the n power. That's all that's going to change. But let's see what that looks like to see why I'm talking about this. Because otherwise, that's our evaluation. But let's see why I want to talk about this. All right, so the summation of n equals 0 to infinity of, in this case, ix to the n power. Let's think about that. If n is 0, we start off with 1. Zero, uh, 1 over 1 is 1. If n is 1, though, we have ix over 1 factorial, which is 1. And then ix to the second power is i squared, which is negative 1. So we have minus x squared over 2 factorial. And then i x to the third power, We again, we know i is i, we know i squared is 1, we know i cubed is i squared times, or i squared is negative 1. We know i, I cubed is i squared times i, which means it's negative i. And i to the fourth is i squared times i squared, which is 1. So i cubed is negative i. So we have minus i times x cubed over 3 factorial. And then we get plus a positive 1, x to the fourth over 4 factorial. Now this pattern is going to continue because this pattern continues for i. So the next term we're going to have is i times x to the fifth over 5 factorial. Then we had a minus, so we're going to have a minus x to the sixth over 6 factorial. Then we had a minus i, so we're going to have a minus i x to the seventh over 7 factorial. And then we're going to have x to the eighth over 8 factorial. And that will repeat at every four terms. Why is this interesting? Well, let's collect all the terms that are real and all the terms that are imaginary. All right, all the terms that are real here. I have 1 minus x squared over 2 factorial plus x to the 4th over 4 factorial minus x to the 6th over 6 factorial. All the real terms are the ones that don't include i. So all those even terms. Then all the terms with i, let's pull i out. And I have, this one had i, so that's x. This one had i, so that's minus x cubed over 3 factorial. Then also the fifth one did. And also the seventh one did. Et cetera, et cetera. I hope this and this look very familiar to you. First one are all the even terms that are alternating. The second one is all the odd terms that are alternating. We just did these. This one here, this is a summation of negative 1 to the n power of x to the 2n over 2n factorial. And this one here, is the summation of negative 1 to the n power of x to the 2n plus 1 over 2n plus 1 factorial. And we know what both these are. This one is cosine of x. This one is sine of x. Cosine plus i sine, otherwise known as cisx. You may have seen that before. Either way, we have that this summation, which was e to the ix, it can be rewritten as cosine of x plus i sine of x. This is sometimes known as Euler's formula. It's something that we used and kind of took for granted to talk about some stuff back in chapter 3 and 3.11. And now we were actually able to prove where it came from. All has to do with the expansions, the power series expansions of E, cosine, and sine, and how they interact with each other. All right, so I just like to talk about that because that's, 
I think it's, it's pretty important to see that relation, and that's one of the most remarkable formulas, honestly, in mathematics. All right. Overall, here's a list of some of the important Maclaurin series. Uh, all of these we talked about except for the last one. 1 over 1 minus x, we talked about that in the last section. We also did uh, tan inverse and natural log of 1 plus x in the last section. So we did this one 11.9, this one 11.9, this one 11.9, and these three we just did in 11.10. E to the x, sine x, and cosine x. I also have the radius of convergences here, and these are also available in your textbook as well. The only one we didn't talk about yet is the binomial series. And the binomial series is this last one here. The binomial series. 1 plus x to the k power, where k can be anything. Can, k can be an integer, k can be any real number. That's going to be the summation of k choose n. That's what this is right here. It's k choose n. Um, times x to the n power. The proof for this is in your textbook. I'll leave that to you if you wish to explore that. Um, but we're going to use that in the next example. Now, when talking about k choose n, that's uh, k over n, I will say that k over n is not the same thing as k divided by n. It's not a fraction. k choose n or k over n is k choose n, which is a combination. This means k choose n, which means what you're going to do is you're going to take k factorial and you're going to divide that by k minus n factorial times n factorial. That's what that expansion refers to. Now, what that really means, since k factorial is going to be the bigger number, say it's 10. Say 10, choose 2. So if you have, say, 10 over 2, then what that means is that you have 10 factorial over 10 minus 2, which is 8 factorial times 2 factorial. Which means overall... 10 factorial and 8 factorial are going to cancel out a lot of terms because 10 factorial will mean 10 times 9 times 8 times 7 times 6 all the way down to 1. And 8 factorial is 8 times 7 times 6 all the way down to 1. So the top will have 10 times 9 and will stop there because 8 through 1 are going to cancel out with 8 factorial. But on the bottom, I still have 2 factorial left over. That's why another way of writing this instead is as k times k minus 1, et cetera, et cetera, down to k minus n plus 1. So one more than the difference between these two. Divided by n factorial. That's another way of thinking about it. I personally like to say if it's 10, choose 2. Then you have the first two numbers from 10 over 2 factorial. So 10 times 9 over 2 factorial. If you have, say, 7 choose 4, that means you're going to have the first four numbers from 7. So 7, 6, 5, and 4, that's four values, over 4 factorial. That's probably, I think, the easiest way to do it. Now with that in mind, we're going to apply the next example. Now this one, this says we're going to find the first five terms of the function cosine of x over the square root of 1 plus x. Now this is going to be one of our first applications where we're going to take an actual function and we're going to replace that with, the, with some terms from the power series. Now we see our function here, f of x equals cosine of x over root 1 plus x. Now we know cosine of x is a power series, so I should be able to replace that as a power series. So I'll multiply that out. But then I also have that 1 plus x over uh, on the bottom with a root. I can rewrite that as 1 plus x to the negative 1 half power. That's the same thing. Negative flipping it down, 1 half being the root. This is going to be our value for k
in a binomial series. So then, what we really have then is cosine, which we know cosine as negative one to the n power of x to the two n over two n factorial. That's cosine. And then for the binomial, whoa. Let's draw that better, shall we? There we go. Then for the binomial, we have in this case, k, k is negative one half, it's that power, k choose n times x to the n. That is going to be our one plus x to the negative one half. Okay, now what we want to do is find the first five terms of this. So now we can write this as a polynomial multiplied by a polynomial. We should be able to evaluate the first five terms. Okay. So to do that, cosine. Uh, let's use the first five terms of cosine and see what happens from there. Cosine is all the even terms starting at 1. So 1 minus x squared over 2 factorial plus x to the fourth over 4 factorial minus x to the 6 over 6 factorial, that's four terms, so let's do one more. And it continues from there. Hopefully that's all we'll need for cosine. Multiplied by all this. This one's gonna be a little more complicated. Now to do binomial, we focus on the equation that's given above. It starts off with one plus kx plus k times k minus 1 over 2 factorial, etc., etc. We're just going to take the choose functions of all these. We're starting off with just 1. Then k, which is negative 1 half. So we'll have negative 1 half times x. Then we're going to have plus, we're going to have negative 1 half. And then negative 1 half minus 1 over 2 factorial, because we have two terms now. x to the second power. Then we want three terms. Negative 1 half, negative 1 half minus 1, and negative 1 half minus 2. That's three terms, so we have 3 factorial and x to the third power. And for good measure, let's have one more. So. Negative one half, since we have one, two, three, four terms, let's do the fifth term to see if that's important. Negative one half minus one, negative one half minus two, negative one half minus three, that's three things, or that's four values up there, so we have four factorial and x to the fourth. All right, let's simplify that down a little bit. The cosine value, there's nothing that really needs to be done there but I really want to find what those coefficients are for that binomial series. Because that one's a little bit tricky. First one's easy, one. Second one, minus x over two, easy. Next one, we have negative one half times negative one half minus one half, so that's negative three halves. So that'll give me an overall positive uh, three over four and two on the bottom. So that will give me positive three over eight times x squared. Or maybe I'll just move that x squared up there. Say three x squared over eight. Again, I got that from doing negative one half times negative three halves gives you positive three over four and then two factorial gives you just two, so three fourths divided by two is three eighths. Minus, you got negative three halves, negative three fourths, and then this is going to be negative five halves. So I have three fourths times negative five halves technically, which is gonna give me negative 15 over eight. Multiply by six on the bottom will give me 48. So I have negative 15 over 48, 
I can cancel that out a little bit. I should at least be able to do a three. Can I do more? Hold on. No, I think that's it. Um, so I should have five on top if I divide 48 uh, by three. I get what, 16? Yeah, 16. So we get x cubed. Last one, uh, the top here gave me uh, 5 over 16, or negative 5 over 16, so, or negative 5 over 8. So then we have to multiply by another one, and this is going to be negative 7 over 2, times negative 5 over 8, which is going to give me positive 35 over 16. So I have 35 over 16 divided by 4 factorial, which is 24. Uh, if you do 16 multiplied by 24 and move that to the bottom, you have 384, and you have 35 left over. So you should have plus 35 over 384, x to the fourth power. All right, that should be good enough. So we have the first few terms here, and what we want to find is the first five terms of the overall series. So... When multiplying polynomials, we know that we're going to multiply each term consecutively. So like one will multiply this term and this term and this term, etc. And then also after we get through the infinite amount of terms, then x squared over two factorial is gonna multiply all of these terms in succession. So what we want is the first five terms. First things first, let's find a constant, which would be the lowest term. That would only happen if I do one times one. So we can find a thicker, there we go. Yeah, if I do one times one, that would be the only way that I could get a constant. And one times one will give me one. Now, is there any way that I can get anything to the power of one? Well, looking through, let's erase those. Looking through my possibilities of multiplying one term from one side and one term from another side, the only way I can get a power of one is by multiplying this one here multiplied by negative x over two. It's the only way I can get something to a power of one. And that's gonna give me simply negative x over two. So far so good. Then I get to x squared and x squared gets a little bit more complex. Okay. Well, to get x squared, I could do a few things. I could take one and multiply by that 3x squared over 8. But I could also do, let's see if I can get another, could also do x squared or negative x squared over 2 factorial times that 1. That could also give me an x squared. So I need both of those. Think about the coefficient there. So if I do the green ones, I'll have a coefficient of 3 eighths. Then if I do the yellow ones, one over two factorial is just one over two times one. So I'll have a negative one half there, x squared. All right, so far so good. Hopefully you're starting to see the pattern of like what I'm doing here and how I'm trying to find out um, if I have terms of a specific size. Okay, I'm gonna stop erasing though because I'm starting to lose terms. All right, now for x to the third power. How do, how do I get x to the third power? So I could get one times that. So I'm gonna have negative five over 16 as a possible coefficient. Then any other ways I could multiply this to the other side to get uh, three. Okay, well I could do x squared over two times x over two. So it'll give me negative one fourth. So that would also give me an x to the third power. And then is there anything else? I don't see any other ways of multiplying two terms and getting x to the third power. I don't have an x to the third power on this side, so that should be it. So it's x to the third power. Note that we already have one, two, three, four terms. We just need one more. So I just want to see how many ways I can get x to the fourth power. All right, well, I could do one times that. 
35 or 384, so I'm going to have 35 or 384. I could also have x squared over 2 factorial times negative 3 x squared over 8. That would give me x to the fourth. So negative 3 eighths times negative 1 half will give me a positive 3 over 16. Could also do x to the fourth times that one. So I'm also going to have a plus 4 factorial is 1 over 24. And I think that's the only ways I can get 4. Yes. Plus dot dot dot. Okay. So 1 minus, maybe I'll do the coefficients first. So I'll say minus 1 half x plus, this is 3 eighths minus 1 half, which is 4 eighths. So that's actually also going to be a minus. And it'll be a minus 1 eighth x squared. And they start to get a little more complicated. This is 5 sixteenths, remember. Um, so that's minus 4 sixteenths, so that's negative 9 sixteenths overall. x to the third power. Then this is definitely going to be a plus, but plus what? Uh, we know 16 times 24 is 384. So 3 times 24 uh, will give you 72. And 1 times 16 will give you 16. So 35 plus 72 plus 16, uh, that will give you 107 plus another 16 will give you 123 over 384, if my math serves. It could be a little bit off there. All right. But that would be it. That would be the first five terms of this series. And now we're coming up with a function that I could use to represent this. This summation here is the exact same thing, at least after a while, of the original function I had. Cosine x over square root of 1 plus x. And this is not easy to do when doing something like a derivative or an integral. But the one I have circle, uh, squared in red, that is. That's just a polynomial. And I could take a derivative or integral of that all day. So that's an example of applying knowledge we already have to find out cosine, sine, etc., etc. Okay, I know this video was long. There was a lot of content to cover. Uh, I promise the videos to come are going to be shorter than this. This is the last section I think is going to be beefy for you guys. But if you have any questions, feel free to put those in the comments below, or you can ask your instructor directly. But with that said, I hope you have a nice day.